And let's get some insight on the U.S. economy and the president's big plans from the chairman of the White House Council of Economic Advisors, Kevin Hassett. Kevin, thanks for being here. It's good to be here. Your overview, first of all, of this report um, just out. You seem kind of ecstatic, but uh, <laughs> I'm always ecstatic. Behind that, right. well, I think that basically what we've done is we published a book with 700 pages that documents that President Trump's policies are working, that the economy has gone from the new normal of low growth to the old normal. 3% growth, and it's doing it precisely because the policies are working the way economists think they should. And so we said a year ago in the fall that capital spending would boom and that factories would come back to America. We've documented that that's happening in the data. We said when the factories would come back that people uh, would be hired more. And so unemployment rate went down to historic lows for just about, about every category, demographic category. And we said that wages would grow a lot because uh, the people with the factories would be competing for workers. And we see that as well. And the most striking thing on that, and then I'll get back to you, I promise that to filibuster is the bottom decile uh, growth. The bottom 10% of Americans saw wage growth last year of 6.5%. Uh, J.P. Morgan, in their forecast for 2019, said this, significant U.S. economic outperformance is unlikely to persist through 2019 as the sugar rush of the fiscal stimulus wanes. Yeah, so, so a lot of people said that we wouldn't have a sugar rush, and now they're calling it a sugar rush, but it's not a sugar rush. So, so sugar rush, again... Means a high which, and a crash. High, in fact, people should Google it. It's, it's even like a myth that sugar does that to you. But, but in any case, <laughs> if, we, if we ate a Twinkie and and ate a bunch of Twinkies and spent all our money on Twinkies, then next year we'd be fat and we wouldn't have any money and we'd be sorry we did that. What happened now is that we didn't you know, eat Twinkies, we took vitamins and exercised and we made the economy stronger and it's stronger, stronger from now on. And so people built more factories last year that made GDP go up because they were buying machines. This year those factories are turning on and they're going to make output and that's going to make GDP go up again. So it's the opposite of a sugar rush. Uh, for the folks who are critical about the next steps, like what are the next steps this administration will take to try to push that growth forward? Well, I think the, the, the first thing is that we just have to like hold the line here. There are a lot of people that want to repeal these policies that in the economic report we demonstrate work. Uh, but then the next thing is that there's a lot of stuff that we could do uh, without Congress uh, in the deregulation space. We have a whole chapter documenting the big impact on the economy, positive in, impact of deregulation. And then there are other things that we could do that require legislation that we hope to like infrastructure spending. You know, America's infrastructure is decaying a lot. We can fix that. And historically, those kind of fixes have happened on a bipartisan basis. Wall Street Journal pointing out that some of the tax cuts uh, expire. They have a, a timeline on them. Uh, they said the 2017 tax law also created temporary incentives for alcohol producers and businesses that provide family leave, both of which expire this year. So by including revenue from expected schedule expirations in the budget, the administration sets fiscal targets in some such a way that either it has to support those tax increases happening as scheduled or find replacement revenue. So which one will you do? Right. Well, in our budget, we basically assume that almost all of the tax cuts are permanent, and that's the way we do the math. And so, and so I don't know what this guy's saying, but that's the way we do the math in our budget. Uh, President Trump has a whole bunch of policy objectives, including things like infrastructure spending, making tax cuts permanent, uh, getting more people into the workforce by adding work requirements to some of the welfare programs, and all of those policies are in the baseline of our assumptions in the economic report. And so if you say, well, that's a rosy scenario, you're saying that maybe there's going to be 3% growth over the next decade. You know, I agree that it's an optimistic scenario because it's a scenario where President Trump's policies are enacted into law. If they're not enacted into law, if, if people obstruct our ability to engage in these positive policies, then for sure growth will fall short. The president's heading to Ohio. Sherrod Brown, the senator from Ohio, has a suggestion about cars. Take a listen. Last week, So I've been talking to the president about this. He finally woke up and acts like he wants to do something. He should be going to Congress and say, pass the American Cars, American Jobs Act. And briefly, it works this way. You buy a car listed of, of 100 vehicles made, mostly in the United States. You buy one of those, you get a $3,500 off rebate at the dealership. So in other words, protect U.S. automakers by giving them this rebate, something that you guys would look at? You know, I, I haven't spoken with the president about that specific proposal, but he has been fighting and fighting and fighting since he's been here for auto workers uh, to move auto plants uh, from other countries to the U.S. And so 
I think that the specific uh, thing that Senator Brown, who I have a great deal of admiration for, is mentioning is that there's a GM plant that's closing in Ohio that the two of them have been talking about. I think that GM has very idiosyncratic problems. Most of the automakers are doing great. Uh, they're expanding. A lot of you know, Ford, Ford is expanding, and, and a lot of uh, foreign manufacturers are moving production to the U.S. And so I think that you know, we certainly want to save that plant, but I think that there are idiosyncratic problems for GM but that don't require a massive new bill. President Trump has been fighting for auto automakers all across the board, and the trade deals with the tax cuts, everything else. The trade deals are a big factor in how this That's economy correct. looks, and you're optimistic. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And Ambassador Lighthizer is continuing the talks with Secretary Mnuchin, and uh, you know, I, I think you know, I, I've said a couple times uh, on the air that, that we're at the point where you don't want the groom to see the bride, uh, but you know, it's really hard to negotiate a trade deal. There's a lot of hard work, and there's a lot of legalese that has to be worked out correctly. And I think Ambassador Lighthizer is the guy that can lead that effort successfully. And optimistic, Kevin Hassett. Uh, yeah, Kevin, always. thanks a lot. Thanks. I appreciate Great your time. To be here. Thanks for having me. Good evening, I'm Brett Baer. We're coming to you live tonight from the White House, where I will talk with one of the president's top economic advisors in just a few minutes. We begin, though, with President Trump saying all options are still on the table in the effort to remove Venezuela's disputed president and his socialist government. The American leader saying here in the Rose Garden, even stronger sanctions may be coming. He spoke with the reporters this afternoon alongside the visiting Brazilian president. Chief White House correspondent John Roberts was there. Good evening, John. Good evening, Brett, and a lovely afternoon in the uh, Rose Garden it was. So far, the effort to oust Venezuelan dictator Nicolas Maduro has been unsuccessful. There have been some cracks in his regime, but so far none big enough to wedge him out. Venezuela was topic A in President Trump's first meeting with the new Brazilian president, Jair Bolsonaro. President Trump indicating he has no idea when dictator Nicolas Maduro may step down, if ever. I'm not being told any specific time, but we really haven't done the really tough sanctions yet. We can do the tough sanctions and all options are open. Brazil shares a border with Venezuela and has been assisting the U.S. in getting humanitarian aid to Venezuelans fleeing economic collapse. Bolsonaro indicated he may allow U.S. troops to base out of Brazil if the need for military action arises. Brazil will be more than willing and ready to fulfill this mission and take freedom and democracy to that country. In welcoming Bolsonaro to the White House, President Trump was almost looking in the mirror. Bolsonaro is known as the Trump of the tropics. He has the same views as the president on immigration, uses Twitter as a megaphone, it's fake news, and decries fake news. We're going to have a fantastic working relationship. Uh, we have many views that are similar. Bolsonaro also represents a break from a long line of anti-U.S. leaders, promising a new relationship with America on everything from trade to energy to military cooperation. President Trump is happy to embrace the change. I also intend to designate Brazil as a major non-NATO ally or even possibly, if you start thinking about it, maybe a NATO ally, which will greatly advance security and cooperation between our countries. In the Oval Office, prior to their joint press appearance, President Trump was asked about his weekend Twitter feud with Meghan McCain after President Trump ripped her father for giving the FBI the unverified Steele dossier. The president was unapologetic, pointing to McCain's vote against repealing and replacing Obamacare. So he campaigned. He told us hours before that he was going to repeal and replace. And then for some reason, I think I understand the reason, he ended up going thumbs up. I think that's disgraceful. I was never a fan of John McCain, and I never will be. President Trump also weighed in on Twitter and Facebook today after his director of social media was temporarily blocked on Facebook and Republican Congressman Devin Nunes filed a $250 million lawsuit against Twitter. It seems to be if they're conservative, if they're Republicans, if they're in a certain group, uh, there's discrimination and big discrimination. I do think we have to get to the bottom of it. President Trump also used Bolsonaro's visit to take a swing at the emerging socialist movement in the Democratic Party here. Bolsonaro won the presidency in Brazil by campaigning against the socialist corruption that had led to Brazil's economic decline. President Trump repeated his mantra that the U.S. economy is stronger than ever and that the last thing we need is socialism. Brett? Thanks, John. The Chief White House Correspondent John Roberts, live on the North Lawn. John?
Chef, good afternoon to you. The two leaders both admitting that they do have a lot in common. Bolsonaro even referred to fake news in his press conference with the president this afternoon. But they did talk at length about Venezuela. As you pointed out, there was no word on whether the U.S. might take military action in Venezuela, only to say, as he has so many times, that all options are on the table. President Trump, President Bolsonaro asked the same thing, wouldn't say whether or not uh, Brazil might uh, commit its military to try to take Maduro out of uh, Venezuela. But when asked Asked whether or not he would allow Brazil to base, or at least allow the United States to base its troops in Brazil, Bolsonaro did say that he wants to be a very strong extra NATO ally of the United States. President Trump even said that he might consider getting Brazil in to be a part of NATO. But when asked about how long it might take for Maduro to step down, President Trump said this afternoon he didn't really know. Listen here. I'm not being told any specific time. Uh, they've been there a long time between him and his predecessor. Uh, at some point, uh, I would imagine uh, things will change. But we really haven't done the really tough sanctions yet. We can do the tough sanctions, and all options are open, so we may be doing that. But we haven't done the toughest of sanctions, as you know. We've done, uh, I would say, uh, right down the middle. But we can go a lot tougher if we need to do that. One of the important questions that was not asked at that press conference or talked about by the president, is the United States pushing Juan Guaido and members of the National Assembly to give amnesty to senior members of the Maduro regime, let them hang on to their wealth and either leave the country or stay in their positions? If they decided to do that, Shep, that might be something that uh, could help to, uh, to tip the table there. John, the president has been on a tear lately in the last few days against the late Senator John McCain, whose daughter Megan has now responded, and today he's coming for McCain again. Yeah, you know, they got into a Twitter fight over the weekend. Megan McCain said yesterday on The View that unlike her father, President Trump would never be a great man, and President Trump asked about that in the Oval Office today, said this. He told us hours before that he was going to repeal and replace, and then for some reason, I think I understand the reason, he ended up going thumbs up. And frankly, had we even known that, I think we would have gotten a vote because we could have gotten somebody else. So I, did, I think that's disgraceful. Uh, plus, there are other things. I was never a fan of John McCain, and I never will be. The president there talking about McCain's vote on repealing and replacing Obamacare. No response to that from Meghan McCain today, other than to retweet a tweet from former McCain aide Mark Salter that was critical of the president. Jeff? John Roberts reporting live from the White House.